Hello out there YouTube land. This is Howler Mouse with another Howler Hustle. A little bit of a comic book haul or else you wouldn't have clicked on to watch this. This is for October of 2024. Uh, the first thing I want to show you here is not from the haul. This is a comic I'm pretty sure that I've been carrying around for years. It probably came from the Stepdad's collection. It is a coverless copy of Scooter, Swingless Scooter, number 28, and uh, inside of it, it's had a, uh, it has a horror story, if you will. Um, very much like Archie meets Scooby-Doo a little bit, even though there's no real monsters and stuff, right? But it is a seance is believing, and so help me, it blows my mind that this character Malibu, I have read comics for way too long, because this was like the opening of uh, some kind of Vertigo comic, uh, <laughs> where they're doing a parody or something, um, with the haunted house and the seances and the trench coat, where I feel like it's uh, John Constantine, uh, you know, Hellblazer fame. So I sort of got a kick out of that. Uh, but yeah, these, these some of these images have stuck with me. So happy, you know, Halloween if you're watching in the month of October. Uh, some of these books are for a dollar. Got them out of a dollar bin. And uh, what can I say? Um, you go through a dollar bin, you never know it's treasure hunting. You never know what you're going to find. And this is a 1987 Silver Blade number one, Carrie Bates, Claus Jansen, and the great Gene Colan. Uh, this was a 12 issue miniseries. And the reason I picked this up is that this is my second copy. And when I go through my boxes and find the first number one, it comes with a free poster. And it is a movie poster because this is an actor. Uh, if I remember the plot, it's sort of like Errol Flynn ends up really having to become Errol Flynn in the real world because there's stuff going on in this set. Uh, so, you know, a little meta, a lot of things going on here. But if you're a Gene Colan fan, Carrie Bates fan, one of those old school fans, you'll like it. Anyway, this is the poster inside. Let's see if it's going to focus. Let me try something new. All right, so we'll just ignore that. We're not going to look at that. Uh, for a dollar, we have this fantastic Brian Bolland cover. Brian Bolland. Uh, this Brian Bolland cover, um, it's just, it just blows me away what this man can do. Uh, I absolutely love anything this guy does. Uh, 1988, so... This may have been the time that in America, um, you know, at least amongst comic book fans, Brian Ballin uh, may have become the household household uh, name with his killing joke with Alan Moore. Uh, so this is just fantastic. Comes with extra features of Private Lives. Paul Levitz, Barry Kithen, Bruce Patterson, and Gary Leach. Uh, if you're a Legion of Superheroes fan, this is probably going to be right up your alley. Uh, fantastic stuff. Now, this is Wasteland. I ended up double dipping when I found these. I got these for two bucks a piece, uh, but I'm willing to do it. Uh, this was just a quirky little series that uh, came out in the 80s. And if you're into like uh, Twilight Zone sort of stories, maybe a touch of EC, uh, even like maybe even a little Kurt Vonnegut, you, you, you have an anthology series where you just never know what you're going to get. Uh, light stories, heavy stories, but we have the great Adele Close. John Ostrander, George Freeman, David Lloyd of V for Vendetta fame, William Messner Loves, where this guy exploded, in my opinion, in the 90s for scripting the Max and what he did with Wonder Woman. And Don Simpson uh, has indie feel to it. Uh, sometimes they do little stories that are homages to American Splendor, but I would say it had more of a more of a underground feel of comics, if you will. You know, so you just never know what you want to get with this. Uh, fantastic covers. Uh, that was what is that number two, I believe? Yeah, this is number three. Two issues of number three. This is number two, and these I do believe I've already had number five number six and number six now i have two issues of number six because uh what they did is they ended up putting the wrong cover i believe on number five and they ended up putting the insides the actual issue of number six inside number five if i remember correctly uh, i was could not believe i found these these were a dollar a piece now the bloodshot movie has come and gone but in the 90s uh, Valiant, the Jim Shooter area in, era, in you know specifically, 
uh, those books were super hot and some of them still are hot, right? But what they would always usually do is Jim Shooter had collectors in mind. Low print runs, that also saved the company money. Um, so each issue could be a collectible because of the low print run. And then he usually, instead of really debuting a hero uh, in their own series with a number one or a zero at the time out of nowhere, you would get a hero cameoing, first appearing in another person's book. So this is... Uh, three copies, I believe, of the first appearance of Bloodsport. Uh, I think I referred to it as Bloodpool a minute ago. But anyway, of Bloodsport. Uh, Bloodsport would finally go on to have a movie uh, with Vin Diesel, play, Vin Diesel playing him. And that movie came, went, I'm pretty sure it bombed. So uh, I now have five total issues of the first appearance of Bloodsport. Uh, if you saw James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, I ended up picking up this Birds of Prey. I don't think I've ever even read an issue of Birds of Prey, even though you know Chuck Dixon can write a hell of a comic. Uh, this is the Gail Simone era, apparently. But I could not believe that this series ran uh, over 100 issues. Um, it blows my mind. So this is number 56 because in James Gunn, The Suicide Squad, you had a character named Savant that uh, was in the movie. Uh, blink and you'll miss him. Uh, and so this is a key because apparently this is his first issue, first appearance in this issue. Excuse me. Birds of Prey number 127. This is the last issue. So, you know, traditionally, last issues usually have a low print run. So I went ahead and grabbed it just in case. Birds of Prey, no more. Tony Bedard. These books were just to go ahead and start completing the run again. Uh, this is the 2000s Jeff John Teen Titans. I want to say like maybe volume four, I believe. He stayed on about 44 issues. Somebody else came on. Uh, and in the middle of his run, you had two issues where they brought in Gail Simone to fill in and Rob Liefeld to do the art. Because the first, uh, you know, before he jumped on the New Mutants and was at Marvel and creating Deadpool and Cable and all that stuff. He had popped up on a four-issue miniseries uh, drawing Hawk and Dove, uh, and Kestrel was the main villain. My brother had the miniseries, so I got to read it. So this is a bit of a, uh, you know, harken back to that. So this is the s part two of the two-part story. All right, just to finish that up. Wasn't real excited to get those, but I am not a Rob Liefeld hater uh, anymore. So anyway, Teen Titans number 41, pretty much what it is. Uh, Miss Martian here was uh, a little bit of a cult following at one point, believe it or not. Um, you know, they had the one year later. Teen Titans, heckening back here to Blue Devil with the Kid Devil. A little bit of a mystery who he was. He ties into Neron with how he got his powers. A uh, little well, sad case, a very sad case. And then we hearken back to the Baxter series by Marv Wolfman of the early 90s, uh, where we had Jericho go up against his father, Deathstroke. They sort of revisit that with this storyline. So here's number 45, Jeff Johns. I thought he left it uh, issue 44, but apparently it was issue 46 was his last series. Um, Deathstroke has a plot that I sort of, I'm still trying to decide if I, I rolled or not, or if this was just an excuse for Jeff Johns to uh, finish up a story quickly. So anyway, Deathstroke versus the Titans. Thanks to the Judas contract, that is always something. Another book I got for a dollar and I showed on a live show not too long ago on Sundays. Make sure you like the video, subscribe, share it, why not? Uh, but this is just a gem. This is my second copy. I absolutely love this annual because it is so under the radar. Uh, 1985, Web of Spider-Man Annual, number two, Charles Vest cover. Charles Vest, at one point in the 80s, was a hot Spider-Man artist. He did Web of Spider-Man, the cover, number one. He popped up in uh, covers on Amazing Spider-Man, had a backup feature. And then, of course, he, got, he got sent to, I believe, I believe it was Ireland, so he could go out there and work on a Spider-Man graphic novel that apparently sold very well. So we have Art Adams and the New Mutants popping up. And during the live show, someone asked me if this was the issue where Warlock turned into Godzilla. Well, yes, it is. Uh, I got to flip through here. Um, 
And, uh, I, you know, I've seen Art Adams draw Godzilla so much. And there's also a uh, New Mutants annual that Chris Claremont and Alan Davis did where the Impossible Man and Warlock pretty much dueled off with shape changing. And I was like, was that where the Godzilla was? So anyway, uh, just fantastic stuff. David Letterman there. But apparently this is a book that a lot of people really, that are in the know, really want because they are Godzilla fans. So let's find that page. There we go. This is the page that uh, everyone goes nuts for, apparently, you know. And I do have it in the 90s. Uh, I have a lot of, I have quite a few things that um, Alan, uh, Art Adams drew uh, when it comes to Godzilla and Creature from the Black Lagoon. Uh, who's in the background feature? Yeah, and then we have some early-ish Mike McNola art with Anne Nacita writing. Anne Nacita also wrote the... Uh, main story here so yeah spider-man story with uh early mike mcnola oh if we'd only known what was to come with him all right oh that tape let me be very careful so we'll put that up later um we have a Gru number one specifically the pacific comics um his first appearance was in destroyer duck number one and i think i have three or four copies of that but it seems like every that group was sort of a mainstay in the house because of Sergio Argonis, uh, Mad Magazine. He was always in the house, and it seems like we always had an issue of Gru around the house, starting with Epic Comics. Uh, I think it's like number ten, um, and you know I ended up having probably half the series without even trying over the years when it moved to Epic. Uh, these specific issues came out before they went to Epic Comics uh, through Marvel. And um, they ended up reprinting the Pacific Comics, I think in 89 or 90, uh, as Guru Chronicles uh, there, which are uh, square-bound um, books. Uh, they're very nice. I have the, the first one as well. And uh, this this is a bit of a treat. I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead here a little bit, right? But uh, this is the book. This is a coverless copy. This came out in 1976. I was extremely young. Uh, this was a stepdad's copy of Hulk number 200, where the Hulk, they, they do a little bit of a fantastic journey, sort of a dreamscape thing, whatever, however you want to say it, but basically the Incredible Hulk gets shrunk down, and I always misspeak because I constantly forget about General Major Talbert, uh, because my focus has always been on General Ross, but anyway, he has to go into basically the mind of General our general, Major Talbot, to save his life. And it's sort of just an excuse to have a 200th issue where Hulk goes up against a bunch of his enemies. Everybody and anybody can pop up at any time, sort of like antibodies to uh, fight him, you know. Uh, and that's an oversimplification for it. So um, every now and then when I find these coverless copies I read as a kid from the stepdad's collection, I go ahead and I find them, and I got a fantastic deal uh, for this from the seller. Uh, he took quite a bit off uh, on eBay, of all places. I found this at a local comic store, uh, more or less. Did not want to get it. I should have gotten it. I went back a few days later. Somebody, of all the comic books they have in there, this was, was gone. Uh, so I could not believe that when I was just looking around and saving things on eBay, I found a pretty much near mint copy uh so when it came in through e you know when it came in the mail to me i was really surprised to find it really was a near mint copy it was this not uh, you know somebody trying to uh set you know push some push some stuff on um ebay get rid of it so uh some of the stuff came from empire comics and some came through a place called cavalier comics one is in wise virginia the other one is in bristol virginia slash tennessee and at one of the places mountain empire comics uh he actually puts out promotional stuff uh, he was cleaning out the the back rooms of the comic book shop because he's having his 40th anniversary camp come up and comic shops are not allowed to sell promotional material and apparently he found a bunch of stuff from the 2000s and the 90s. So I was able to snag this promotional poster of the late and great John Cassidy when he was on uh, the Astonishing X-Men with John Cassidy announcing it. So this is very cool. This will be getting framed and on a wall. You know, it's just, you know, it has some tape where it was already taped up years ago. 
Uh, it was fantastic to find. And uh, I'm not going to go into the history of this character, but this character came from uh, a manga. This character has actually showed up in video games. Uh, but it's the meanest little dinosaur uh, you've ever seen. Uh, we got some promotional material of Gone, and I believe this is from the 90s. But we can find out exactly when it was from because it's a poster from 2000's uh, calendar. It's a calendar, uh, you know, for the year 2007. So this thing is going to be correct every seven years. Uh, we'll see what's going in, going on. So that was actually pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I got two of those. I didn't realize they were calendars when I bought them, or didn't buy them. I was they were they were for free. And this was fantastic to find. This cardboard. This is why I'm, there's a bunch of stuff from the 90s. But uh, Chris Bacalo, Generation X promotional piece, cardboard, cardboard like. That is fantastic. Uh, I was really excited when I saw that. Uh, not so much because I'm a Generation X fan, but because I'm a Chris Bacalow fan. And this was a series that, uh, in my opinion, got named so that uh, Wildstorm Studios at Image had to change a comic that was going to be called Gen X to Gen 13. I also believe that's a better name, uh, Gen 13, much more original. And uh, it blows my mind somewhere a few months ago, a few weeks ago, I found that the, I bought the comic just because of the posterity, if you will, that uh, even after having uh, the, you know, the, the, the background story of uh, what Marvel did there uh, to stop, uh, to, to keep the name, if you will, maybe, maybe they already had this in the works, who knows, who knows, it was Scott Lobdell, Scott Lobdell and, and uh, Chris Bacalow here, who knows, fresh off of Vertigo. But anyway, uh, they had a crossover, a one-shot crossover with both teams. I was like, well, i got to get that. And then these were bought today in my town, uh, Hillsville, Virginia, which is maybe an hour and a half away from me. Was I found out last night through a buddy texting me. Uh, they, they had, a, uh, they had a, a comic book convention going on today. Just wasn't up for going. You know, I slept in just a bit uh, after, you know, insomnia last night. And, but in town that I live in, the local library in October always has like this small little comic book convention that I would not even drive in from the next town to because it's that small and it's meant to be local. Well, I went there and I walked around and I actually found a guy that was selling, you know, he was stuck in the corner and he was actually selling, I wonder who's calling me. They were actually selling, uh, he was actually selling some stuff and he had issues, volumes one through, I think, eight of the Dark Horse phone book trades of Savage Sword of Conan from uh, the Bronze Age. Uh, Gil Kane, Neil Adams, John Bushima, Roy Thomas. Uh, my favorite version of, the, of, of Conan and the one that I actually grew up on wasn't so much the comic, even though some of the comics were floating around. It was the pulps in the magazines of Savage Sword of Conan. So I now have volume one and two. Uh, this was fantastic. And the price I paid, uh, it's, it's not that these are expensive. It's that they are impossible to, they're really, really hard to find out in the wild. And I'm assuming it's because the people that have them want to keep them. This is actually worth about $18 uh, of actual value due to, you know, with a price grade, price grade price guide grade thank you and uh i got on ebay and saw that these things were going for i saw them from uh i think it was something like 35 dollars up to i saw one for 80 and everything in between but it seems like 30 i don't know 35 to 45 dollars at that time was an average so i got that for a steal today then uh, to go on with the Conan stuff, uh, I went ahead and uh, ended up uh, getting this as part of the deal. He told me the price that he wanted on this uh, phone book trade, and I was like, "Well, throw that in, and I'll say yes." So I got Titans number one of uh, from last year of their Conan the Barbarian, since Titan Comics, you know, got the license. Uh, Marvel really didn't keep it that long this time around. So uh, I've been on a Conan just. Unreal, uh, you know, I've, I got the last issue of the Marvel run from 31 years ago, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Hopefully, I showed that uh, in a live show, and then I ended up finding this, uh, you know, so that was fantastic. And then there's a gentleman who recognized me from uh, from uh, the, the YouTube channel here, 
And when he said that, I had to buy something from him. I was already eyeballing this. I asked him, how much is, are these going for? He had a stack of these. Uh, and they're in pretty good condition. A lot of dog, dog ears and stuff. He had, I don't know, three to five copies. Said he had more somewhere. I went through and found you know, what looked like the best one. Uh, because the last time I tried to get this, $5. And um, I wish I could remember the gentleman's name, but I'll be bringing him up later because I've already subbed his YouTube channel. Apparently, he's he's on his own, you know, he's he's uh, delving into it. Apparently, he's had one for a little while. But anyway, uh, the last time I tried to get this to have a reader's copy, um, I got it. And it was probably around 2015 or 16. And in my apartment, I just tossed this across the room back and forth from stack to stack for like about three or four months before I finally sat down to read it. And when I read it, it is actually signed by, on the inside front page, it was actually, and I got it for a dollar, it was signed by Chris Claremont, Walt Simonson, and Terry Austin on the inside. I ended up taking it to Heroes Con, I believe. Heroes Con or Baltimore Con? Probably Heroes Con. Uh, and I was able to meet Walt Simonson while he was there one year, and he did confirm the signatures. So that was fantastic. So now we have a better a, a comic in better shape that does not have signatures. The other one was a little beat up to begin with. So that's that's pretty cool. So that's it. October 2024. Lots of Barbarians, lots of Teen Titans, lots of Hulk, Bronze Age to the 2000s, promotional stuff. Uh, lots of fun, lots of great stuff. Uh, everybody be excellent to each other and read your comics.